to, to um, bring to mind uh, the gratitude, the acknowledgement it's so important to make about the lands on which we are here sitting and, and gathering. Um, this place, uh, we, we may be in different places uh, in, uh, in the world and on the earth. Uh, this, this place where we're gathered in person, um, uh, Chichaga, also known as Montreal, um, has been the home um, for millennia of, the, uh, of many indigenous people, and in particular, the uh, Kanyankahaga or Mohawk nation um, has stewarded this land. And, and uh, just as we are gathering uh, from different places, gathering to join our hearts and our minds together uh, for our own benefit and the benefit of the world. Um, so uh, peoples have for thousands of years, um, our indigenous brothers and sisters, our, our ancestors um, in terms of our human uh, human membership in the human family uh, have have uh, gathered here in a similar vein uh, to uh, join hearts and minds uh, for their benefit and the benefit of others. Uh, so um, so let's uh, let's take a moment in gratitude uh, for for the, these people uh, who who still are among us, with us, in a very vibrant uh, and creative way, and also are orienting their activities towards justice and towards uh, education, uh, that we would remember, um, more, have a deeper memory of, of this land, of, of who inhabited this land. Um, and so, uh, so let's, yeah, open our hearts, uh, in, in respect and in gratitude and, uh, and perhaps in, in, in questioning ourselves, what is our commitment and how, how can we each make a commitment to educate ourselves, to become more aware and to engage, uh, in, in this deeper understanding of, of our, our ancestors, our neighbors, and our friends. Um, so I'd like to, in that spirit, I'd like to welcome each and every one of you here. Uh, so um, the people who are joining by Zoom, uh, people in, uh, people and, and other beings, um, Perhaps uh, there are other critters uh, besides from a dog who has made an appearance. Um, maybe I bet there is, there's a cat or two lurking in the background, somebody's house. And, uh, and I'm gonna just, um, so four people seated here uh, that you can see each other, say hello. Um, so our little sangha, our community gathered together here to, uh, to explore and practice the Dharma, the teachings of the Buddha. Uh, and we do this um, again for our, for our welfare and for the welfare of all beings. Um, and in that, in that spirit, we're going to, um, if you like, you can join me in chanting the, excuse me, um, the, uh, the homage to the Buddha and the three refuges and the uh, precepts. Uh, these are, if, um, so just if you're new to this, um, 
because uh, uh, there are a couple of people who are new to this group in the studio. So the homage to the Buddha, um, the way I understand it, it's it's uh, reminding us what is our what are what what can we give priority of place to in our lives, you know. And so yeah, I I I pay homage to the Buddha, you know. So because I find in my own life, you know, I get kind of fascinated by people who are very clever or very educated or, you know, um, maybe very, uh, very charismatic, um, but they're not always the wisest and most compassionate people. So I, I, uh, I, I remind myself by say, saying this homage, most of all, first of all, I give homage to the Buddha. And then I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Buddha, who is not just a person um, who lived historically. That's an important fact. Um, perhaps more essentially, Buddha is that awakening factor that is alive and present and essential as who we are. And the Dharma and the teachings and even more essentially, the Dharma is how we are realizing the teachings in our day-to-day -day lives, which is an ongoing and unfolding process. And the Sangha is us, uh, those who gather. I mean, historically, the Sangha is people through two and a half millennia who have, um, who have practice with the Buddha and kept those teachings alive, carrying them forward in history for us to receive today, which is really, it's just so uh, wonderful and uh, beautiful, what a gift. Uh, so, so, and then, uh, and then after the, um, the refuges, we chant the precepts, which are our commitments to non-harming, in various ways, not to take life, but rather to support life, not to take what's not offered, not to steal, but rather to be generous, not to misuse our sexuality, but rather to be mindful and, and use our sexuality and the eroticism of our bodies to uh, engage skillfully. Um, and, uh, not to lie, but to speak the truth with courage and with love, and not to uh, not to be not to become addicted um, in ways that cause carelessness and heedlessness. So all of these are ways that we renew our commitments to live to bring to bring our lives into alignment with our deep intention to awaken to. Liberate, liberate ourselves from suffering. So, um, so I'll share the screen now for those who are on Zoom. Oops, that's not it. It's my email. Share the screen. Forgive me, I'm, I'm, uh, I did open file and now I, uh, I'm having trouble accessing it. Okay. So I may need your help again um, to share the screen because it closed.
So uh, if you wish to chant with me um, uh, at home, you'll need to make sure you're muted. Um, and here, please welcome, you're welcome to chant with me if you wish, um, or you just listen or, or read the English translation, whatever, whatever is um, most supportive for you to enter into this uh, contemplation of, of the refugees. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. Namo tasa. Bhagavato Arahato Samma Sambuddhasa Udang Saranang Gachami Damang Saranang Gachami Sanam Saranang Gachami Duti ampi budang saranang gachami. Duti ampi damang saranang gachami. Duti ampi sangam saranang gachami. Tati ampi budang saranang gachami. Tati ampi damang saranang gachami. <coughs> Tuti ampi sangam saranang gachami. Anati pata vera mani sika padam samadhyami. Adina dana vera mani sika padam samadhyami. Kamesu mitatara vera mani sika padam samadhyami. Musa wada vera mani sika padam samadhyami. Sura Maraya Maja Pamadatana Vera Mani Sika Padam Samadhyami Ida Misilam Magafala Yanasa Pachayo O Tu Sadhu Sadhu, sadhu, anumodami.
So um, I have been, for those of you who are joining for the first time uh, today, uh, for the past, um, well, since the beginning of September, uh, we have been uh, exploring a, a key discourse of, um, of the Buddha called the Satipatthana Sutta. So sati means mindfulness and, um, and uh, patana means to establish, to, to make uh, kind of, to, to, to make the foundation in our lives, to apply. Uh, and so they're often referred to as the four foundations of mindfulness. But the word foundations is a little static it can, it, you know, it, 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 it gives me the image of something that's like a block and, uh, and it's kind of there, but actually it's something that is very dynamic because we're exploring these four, which are uh, mindfulness of the body and mindfulness of feelings and mindfulness of the mind and mindfulness of dhammas, which, um, are sometimes translated formations. Um, so they're frameworks by which one, one way to understand is frameworks by which we understand and experience um, the world around us. Uh, very largely conceptual frameworks, but also the different, you know, the different frameworks within which we take in the world, our senses and so on. So, so we're, we, we become mindful of all of these. Uh, and so, um, so this, this discourse, you know, be, it's, so, uh, it, it's so profound and it's so, uh, it, it really um, brings us into the practice of mindfulness of every moment of our experience, every, uh, everything that we, uh, can experience um, physically, mentally, emotionally, uh, not only when we're sitting meditation, but also in every moment of our daily lives. Um, and, um, and so we've been just very slowly uh, working our way into the first chapter, which is the mindfulness of the body. And um, and I'm just going to um, uh, write in the chat uh, the name of this discourse and um, a suggestion for a tr particular translation, which um, which is. Uh, to a very large extent, uh, the translation used by the scholar and yogi Bhikkhu Analayo, whose book I've been referring to, it's called Satipatthana Meditation, a Practice Guide. Um, so I think that for those on the screen, those on Zoom, uh, those on the screen, <laughs> those at home, <laughs> um, uh, you, I've been, I've given this to you, and you probably received it, and so you uh, here can look at it if you like. After, um, it's a, it's a very wonderful book, and it's, it's just what it calls itself a practice guide. So it's, he's written other books which are very scholarly, um, with lots of footnotes, but this is not. It's more uh, for being applied, and. Um, and so he uses, for the most part, he uses that uh, the translation by Nanamali, although he says he has changed it to a certain extent. Um, so in, in the first part of the discourse, um, I, mean, I, I, I thought I'd read a few short paragraphs I find that the language of the Buddhist suttas is, uh, 
I found I find it touches me very deeply. It's very direct and um, and 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 clear. Um, and so uh, and it has it also has a uh, this a very traditional sound because these these discourses were passed on through an oral tradition. They weren't written down for a number of centuries uh, after the life of the Buddha. And so, so they have this uh, repetitive quality of, of a, you know, of that which is tr transmitted through an oral tradition. Mm. So it begins, um, thus I have heard. <coughs> And uh, thus I have heard is, um, is actually referring that the, the Buddha's close, uh, very close and dear um, attendant, uh, personal attendant, who was also his cousin, Ananda, uh, had, a, had an amazing memory. And so after the Buddha died, Ananda uh, repeated to the gathering of the bhikkhus and bhikkhunis, the, uh, the followers of the Buddha, male and female. Um, and, um, uh, and other gendered uh, as well, I'm sure. And, um, and so uh, for, so that they could be remembered and practiced and repeated among themselves. And so, all of the discourses begin with, thus I have, have I heard. On one occasion, the blessed one was living in the Kuru country where there was a town of the Kurus named Kamasadama. And there he addressed the bhikkhus thus, bhikkhus, venerable sir, they replied. Uh, and then, it goes on to say, the blessed one said this. So, so just before I read that part, um, people who have studied these discourses and done um, you know, historical exegesis of these discourses uh, say that this particular discourse was given after uh, the Buddha had been teaching for a while, actually, and particularly in that part of the country. Um, and so people had some basis. So they had some basis of some of his even more foundational teachings, which were his the teachings on the precepts, the ethics. So recognizing that if you're living a life which is, you know, causing harm, exploiting, stealing, lying, um, that it's really, uh, it's so uh, counterproductive and um, disruptive to any Dharma practice you might try to establish. So, so people had that, uh, that, that ethical beat basis and also the Buddha would always teach generosity um, as, as one of the most uh, primary teachings, this teaching of generosity um, awakens us, reminds us that we are interdependent, that we're not separate in our lives, that, that we have received from the generosity of, of others, of our parents, our families, our communities, and that you know, we live interdependently and and it's important for us to continue that mutuality of giving and receiving. So these, these are the, uh, the formative teachings. Um, and um, and so, so people had some basis of that. So that, so that this, this, this discourse um, really, it's not something that you, well, it's not that a, somebody who's new to meditation or new to the Dharma couldn't study it. It's, it's that it really helps to also bring in these other teachings as we 
as we um, delve into the Satipatthana. So the Blessed One said this, Bhikkhus, this is the direct path for the purification of beings, for the surmounting of sorrow and lamentation, for the disappearance of pain and grief, for the attainment of the true way, for the realization of Nibbana, awakening, namely the four foundations of mindfulness. So um, these are beautiful words. Um, surmounting of, of sorrow and lamentation. Um, I, yeah, we get, we get so caught up in sorrow and lamentation. Purification. Purification is a word that I find sometimes is tricky because it can set up a sense of, you know, pure versus impure. Um, whereas uh, it's, it's a discernment process of that which is wholesome versus that which is unwholesome. It's, it's that, it's that uh, those ethical uh, foundations that I was referring to a moment ago. Um, that, that living in a way that is wholesome, non-harming, leads to happiness. Living in a way which is, um, which is unwholesome and uh, can just concerned with, uh, you know, grasping and pushing away uh, greed and hatred and so on. Uh, these lead to suffering for ourselves and for others. So. So it's, um, it's for deepening that, that discernment, wholesome and unwholesome. For the disappearance of pain and grief, the attainment of the true way, the realization of Nibbana, namely the four foundations of mindfulness. So, um, so these are, um, then the next paragraph that I'll read is, is the Buddha's statement of what are these four foundations, which I just said to you in a few words, and then, and then some of the qualities that are needed to cultivate these four foundations. What are the four? Here, bhikkhus, a bhikkhu or a meditator or practitioner, um, bhikkhu just simply, all, all scholars are agreed that bhikkhu is not a gendered word, it simply means somebody who practices. Bhikkhu abides contemplating the body as a body, ardent, fully aware, and mindful, having put away covetousness and grief for the world or um, Analyo uses the word uh, discontent with the world. He, he abides or one abides contemplating feelings as feelings, ardent or diligent, fully aware and mindful, having put away covetousness and discontent for the world. One abides contemplating mind as mind, ardent, fully aware, and mindful, having put away covetousness and discontent with the world. One abides contemplating mind objects or dhammas as dhammas, ardent, fully aware, and mindful, having put away discontent and grief for the world. Or another, um, yeah, uh, I should say, um, I just want to correct myself. Yeah, the, the phrase covetousness and grief, Analyo uh, translates as um, uh, grasping and discontent. So it was grief for the world that he, he translated as, as discontent. I got that mixed up. 
So anyway, these are, these are qualities. Uh, and I just wanted to take a few minutes in our practice in, in our in this in this little uh, brief Dhamma talk to to talk about these qualities of mind that the Buddha talks about that we bring to our practice. So ardent. So that that that's an anomaly's translation and and uh, analio uses the word diligent the, the word in um in pali just if you're interested is uh, atapi and um and so uh ardent means to me i i feel there's a heart quality in that when i when i'm ardent and, and diligent, you know, sounds a bit more like this discipline. There's care. Care also brings that heart quality. So I approach, you know, so I think that that the Buddha is saying, as we approach our practice, as we, you know, whether it's our practice in daily life or our practice when we're sitting down on a chair or cushion or, or lying down or standing, whatever posture we're in, uh, doing a formal practice, that we we orient the heart and mind in this way of caring. Like I'm taking this time, I'm I'm bringing my energy, I'm bringing my attention with all my heart, you know, with my care, with my diligence, and and why do we do that? Like, where does that come from? You know, what, what do you think would motivate us to bring that care? I mean, maybe just ask yourself, we can talk about it a little bit later on. You know, what, when you decide that you're gonna sit in meditation, whether you have a regular daily practice or whether it's on and off and up and down, like many of us, are you know it's it's something that we build it's something that we we need to renew again and again um, uh, maybe we lose touch with our practice and then we begin again what brings us back what reminds us how important it is to practice what brings that ardency that diligence that caring quality of yeah, I really need to, I really need to sit, or I really need to be attentive and mindful and careful as I go about my daily life, as I, as I connect with the people in my lives, as I talk to the people in my house, uh, in my workplace. Um, I think it can be many things, you know, I, one thing that I'm sure for me that it is that reminds me to come back to my practice is the experience of suffering. When I, when I, I suffer because I'm grasping, because I'm discontent with you know, my life as it is that I think my life should be something different. Um, and I always, you know, whenever I, I make a statement like that, I always want to put a little parentheses and add saying that discontent uh, is a cause of suffering doesn't mean that we shouldn't bring our energy and attention, attention to trying to build a more just and peaceful and kind world and society. It doesn't mean that, you know, when the Buddha says wanting things to be other than how they are is the cause of suffering. It, it means that we find a place of 
peace within ourselves, when we can find a way of peace within ourselves and acceptance for our own lives and gratitude for our own lives and how our lives are unfolding, we can then come from that place with wisdom and with skill and kindness to address what we see as harm. And um, so it's, it's, a, it's a common mistake when people first hear these, you know, some of these teachings, does it mean passivity? Does it mean inactivity? So ardent, clearly knowing, aware, I think those are, yeah. Um, so fully aware and clearly knowing are two different translations of the Pali word Sampajana. And I last week, uh, for those who you, those who, you who were here, I talked a little bit about clearly knowing. So, so being mindful. Sometimes people think that mindfulness is being in the present moment. And people will say, um, yeah, so if I'm mindful and I'm in the present moment and like when I, I'm, I'm sensing, you know, hearing, I'm hearing, you know, I'm not caught up in my thoughts. And that's true. But another, another mental quality that co-arises with that uh, present moment awareness is the clear knowing that we are mindful. So it's kind of like a knowing of the awareness, awareness that we are hearing, that we are feeling. Um, so it's, uh, and, and, the, and, the, and the Buddha uses this phrase, clearly knowing or, or fully aware again and again and again in our, uh, in, in, the, in the discourse. And it, it, can, it can be a, uh, like just a little call for us like to, like to, just to bring to mind, fully aware. You know, what's full awareness in this moment? Full awareness in this moment could mean presence in the body, groundedness in the body, an open heart. It could mean tuning in to what the energy is in the body. Is there an energy of kind of resistance or contraction, or anxiety? What's the quality of energy that's present in the body and mind? So clearly knowing it's it's honesty, it's acceptance, it's um, it's that open, open heart, open mind uh, that we bring to each moment. And so, so diligent or ardent, clearly knowing and mindful. So, so that there's a distinction between, you know, like ardent, clearly knowing and mindful means that they are somewhat different qualities. And, and um, uh, Andy Olensky, who is a, uh, a, a contemporary Buddhist scholar, um, wrote a wonderful article on mindfulness. And he said that, that mindfulness co-arises in our practice with many different mental qualities. So these, these are some that the Buddha highlighted in this discourse, uh, you know, and, and there are others such as, um, you know, uh, a certain degree of equanimity that, that we're not grasping, we're not pushing away. And, and this is actually what the, the next thing that, that the Buddha names, having put away covetousness and grief for the world.
So free from desires and discontent. So, so it, how does that work that, that maybe I am kind of motivated, moved to meditate because I'm full of desires and discontent <laughs> because, because, and I'm suffering from these desires and discontents. Uh, and, and so uh, in this moment of, you know, in this case, you know, talking about formal meditation, uh, I'm for this moment, I'm not believing in all of my desires and discontents. I'm, I've come to the recognition that these desires and discontents, whatever they are that I'm caught up in, is the source of my suffering. And so I'm putting them aside. I'm, I have enough space of mind to say, I'm going to not keep going over and over and over again in the story of my desires and my discontents, my grief and my um, uh, covetousness and, and whatever we wanna call it, you know, um, all of those different uh, ways that we get so caught up in, in self and story in me versus you, me versus them, um, and just just take this moment to stop and come to the body and sit. And then the Buddha says, uh, you know, then the the next in the next sen sentence, the Buddha then talks about contemplating. He begins contemplating the body as a body. He says, um, how do we go about doing this? How do we, how do we abide contemplating the body as a body? So that's an interesting phrase, the body as a body. So the body, not as a metaphor, the body not as uh, something, a thing of beauty, uh, the body not as a, um, a biological system that, you know, uh, a medical analysis might bring us to, but just the body in its element of being a body, what are its characteristics? So, and then he, he says, find a quiet place, you know, find a place that just takes you out of the busyness of your life. And, and some of the examples he gives is go to a forest or to the root of a tree or an empty hut, so, or a quiet room, um, and sit down and, uh, and sit in a balanced way, with the body erect, or um, later on in the discourse, he says there are other postures one can use, such as uh, standing or lying down. And he goes on to talk about mindfulness of breathing. So, um, so in this in this little introduction, the Buddha talks about the different qualities that we bring to our practice, um, and uh, and so they're qualities that we can we can intentionally cultivate. You know, we might we might think, you know, very often we might think. Uh, I don't feel very motiva motivated to meditate right now. It happens. Um, and, um, and so how do we arouse if we don't, if ardency is not there, you know, how can we arouse ardency to practice mindfulness? Maybe we can Um, bring to mind an aspiration that we have. 
be a more loving and compassionate person, to be more open-hearted, to be able to express our, our care, our love and compassion more freely and openly. Uh, or maybe we might recall reactivity that we experienced. Maybe we can have an, an altruistic motivation to, to offer our practice for the benefit in whatever way of, of beings, in whatever way that unfolds in our lives. So we can, we can remind ourselves, we can gather, collect this sense of intention or ardency. Arden, fully aware and mindful, so fully aware. So bringing that awareness to the body as we, as we sit or stand and take our, our posture for meditation. So let's do that now. Let's, um, you, might, uh, you might want to um, take a moment to stretch. So please feel free to do that if you want to stand up, release your posture. Feel very welcome to do that, take a minute. So as you take a posture, be aware of how the body feels, how the body is comported on the earth. Does it feel balanced? Does it feel easeful? The body should feel easeful, not, um, not painful, not constricted. We want to, as much as possible, maintain a certain degree of stillness in the body. So we don't wanna be moving every few seconds, shifting because then the mind doesn't settle, the mind doesn't calm down if the body's always moving. So balance and ease in the body is very supportive of the mind becoming more calm. And another aspect of the posture uh, that is named in this discourse is that the spine is erect, back is straight and energized. So lifting from the base of the spine through the crown of the head and the chin tucked in, shoulders straight and relaxed. So if you feel a kind of contraction, if your shoulders are drawn toward your, your ears, you can just uh, intentionally Invite them to drop, relax. The eyes can be closed or slightly open with the gaze forward and down. The hands can be resting on the thighs or in the lap in whatever way it feels comfortable.
we can bring this um, mental capacity that is called proprioception, to be aware of the posture of the body. So bringing our sense of presence, attention into the body and being aware of the, the energy and sensations inside the body is called interoception. And these are two qualities that help us to be present in the body mindful of the body, in the body, was the phrase the Buddha used. Mindful of the body, in the body. first practice in this section on mindfulness of the body is mindfulness of breathing. And so we bring our attention, our awareness to breath. Feeling the breath in the body. Perhaps you may notice it in a particular place, such as in the nostrils or in the chest or in the abdomen. And it can be helpful to have this, what's called an anchor, to bring your attention back to the breath. As the mind gets caught up in patterns of daydreaming or planning or having inner conversations, and then there's a moment of being mindful of these and coming back to the body, coming back to the breath. And gradually over the course of your practice, practice of over time, that the breath, the mindfulness of breathing, mindfulness of the body 
become commingled, that we have a sense of the whole body breathing. So we're mindful, mindful of the whole body and mindfulness of the breath is also present in whatever form it happens to, to manifest, to come up in our awareness.
thoughts and stories, fantasies, planning, remembering. That we sometimes get so identified with. We have their own energy, thoughts think themselves, planning plans itself, the mind just generating patterns and words and images in a, in a very habitual way, a very driven way. When, when we meditate and we become more aware of how these thoughts just pop up and then disappear. It can loosen our grip on them, our, our sense of self, our sense of uh, identification with them. We can hold them more lightly, which can be a relief. we grounding ourselves in mindfulness in the body, mindful of the body in the body, It's a, it's a very ancient tradition in Buddhism to dedicate the goodness of our practice to the benefit of all beings. And by the goodness of our practice, 
the way I understand it is those moments of, of peace, of serenity, of open heartedness, kindness, compassion, compassion for ourselves, compassion for all beings, other beings, insight, sense of freedom, of seeing into the nature, the impermanent nature of suffering, the impermanent nature of our ideas, All of these are blessings. And they're intangible. It's intangible. It's not something we can share in a, in a tangible way, but we can bring this intention to share the goodness of our lives, of our practice, and all of our lives generosity that arises, the love that arises, to share this with the world. What does it feel like to say to ourselves, I'm grateful for these moments that have emerged in my practice today. And they're precious. And I want to share them. And what does that mean for us? To bring that intention into our lives. Because I, in my experience, these moments of opening into passion, wisdom, generosity, love, truthfulness are more precious than anything I can pick up in my hands. And so how can I, how can I share that? It's a kind of a contemplation. First of all, just in dedicating our practice, we bring this intention. I, I share this, I dedicate the beauty, the preciousness, the sacredness of my practice. I dedicate it to you and you and you and to those I know and those that I don't know who are suffering, who are growing, who are creating, who are alive with me in this life. The goodness, the blessings of our practice in our lives serve and support happiness, well-being, and liberation of all beings. practice. So we could stop the recording now.